If you've been following the automotive news about the new 2023 Ford Ranger release, you may have heard about the new Raptor version that Ford is releasing as well. You may also have heard that the Raptor has a unique rear suspension that is very different from the base version. Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace and this is Suspensions Explained. The new Ford Ranger pickup truck is coming out in a number of different variants, including the top-end Raptor. And while base versions use a very standard leaf spring rear suspension, the Raptor uses a four-link design with a Watts link. What makes this interesting is that Ford also has the Bronco, which is based on the Ranger platform, and it uses a similar four-link suspension design, but this time with a pannard rod instead of a Watts link. So what's the difference between these designs and why would Ford or any other OEM choose one over the other? To understand this, we take a step back and look at the function of a suspension. The job of any suspension is to control the motion of the wheels and to allow the wheels to move up and down in a controlled manner over bumps and road irregularities. The suspension has to do this in a way that gives the driver confidence that the car will remain in control, provides good steering feel, and also makes the ride comfortable for everyone in the vehicle. The first part, the bit about controlling the motion of the wheels, is all about controlling the degrees of freedom of the wheel. If you haven't seen my video on degrees of freedom, you can watch it here. When you have a live axle, like the Ranger and Bronco use, we need to allow the axle to move up and down, but we also need it to roll so that the body can roll in a corner and move when only one wheel hits a bump. This means we need to keep two degrees of freedom available. And if you've watched the degrees of freedom video, you will know that this means the axle needs to be attached with no more than four links. This is why basic live axle rear suspensions, ones that are not based on leaf springs, use four links. Here is a model of a four link live axle. You can see how it allows the axle to move up and down and to roll side to side. The problems come in when you look at the other function of the suspension, which is to do everything in a way that is comfortable for everyone in the vehicle. For a suspension engineer, this means instead of using stiff ball joints for all the link connections, they need to use rubber bushings, which absorb energy and isolate the vehicle from the impacts and shocks coming up from the road through the tires. Unfortunately, all that rubber means the suspension can no longer precisely control the movement of the wheels, and this is especially true for live axles. Because of the angle of the links, even small deflections in the bushings means there can be a lot of movement in the axle side to side. This movement can be felt by the driver as imprecise steering and handling and a general lack of confidence in the capabilities of the vehicle. It may ride nice, but it's no fun to drive in the twisty roads. The solution is to stop the side-to-side -side movement of the axle in a way that doesn't hurt ride, and this is where the pannard rod and watts links come in. Both systems limit the amount of side-to-side -side movement in the axle, but they go about it in different ways. Let's look again at a regular four-link axle design. Here you can see the four links, two in red and two in green. Since this model doesn't contain any bushings, I can't show you how the axle moves side to side, but you can imagine that if all of these attachments were rubber, then the axle would be able to move side to side by deflecting each of these points just a little bit. Now let's look at a pattern rod, shown here in yellow, which just takes the four link design and adds a lateral rod between the axle and the frame. For those of you paying attention, you might have noticed that we now have five links, which means we only have one degree of freedom left over. And you would be right. But how do we get both vertical and roll motion out of this axle then? Well, that's because this design relies on bushing deflection to make it work. If there were no bushings in this design, if all of the joints were hard heim joints, for instance, it wouldn't work at all. And since this model uses mathematically perfect joints and links, I have to remove one of them to make it work in the computer so I can show you how the pannard rod affects the motion. I'll do that by removing one of the upper links. If we didn't do that, here is the motion we would get. Notice how roll and vertical motion are coupled together. I can't move one independently of the other. This means there is only one degree of freedom. Let's look again, but this time with that upper link removed. The axle is able to move up and down and roll independently. As the axle moves up and down, the end of the bar that is attached to the axle moves up and down with it. If the axle tries to move side to side, the stiffness of the bar prevents that from happening. Unfortunately, 
because the bar is attached to the frame at the other end, the end that is attached to the axle moves up and down in an arc instead of straight up and down. This means it is pulling the axle side to side in an arc motion as well. Here you can see that the axle is clearly moving in an arc instead of straight up and down. To minimize the arc, it is important to make the panned rod as long as possible. But, of course, the vehicle is only so wide, so there are limits as to how long you can make it. It is also important to make sure the rod is as close to horizontal as possible. This is because during cornering, the rod is either in tension or compression, depending on which direction the corner is in, left or right, and which end of the panned rod is connected to the frame, and which end is connected to the axle. Let's imagine if we were in a left-hand turn. This means the cornering force will be pushing the axle to the left. The rod will be in tension, and if it is at an angle, let's suppose that instead of being attached here, it was attached here to the frame. Now the rod is at an angle, and the tension in the rod would want to tend to pull it horizontal, which means it's trying to pull the suspension up or pull the body down. If, on the other hand, we're in a right-hand turn with the car going to the right, now the cornering forces are in the opposite direction, and the rod will be in compression. If the rod is now at an angle, this rod will want to tend to stand up, thereby pushing the body up. And so you can see how a pannered rod, if it is not as close to horizontal as possible, will behave differently in a right and a left turn. The Watts link, on the other hand, doesn't have these issues and limitations, but it is a lot more complex. Instead of a single link, the Watts link uses three a vertical center link, and two upper and lower horizontal links. The center link is mounted on a central pivot to the axle housing, and the upper and lower links are each attached to the center link on one end and to the vehicle on the other. If the locations of the links are designed correctly, the result will be that the center pivot, where it is attached to the axle, will move up and down in a straight line and keep the axle moving up and down in a straight line as well. Here you see how a properly designed Watts link keeps the axle moving up and down straight. Even if we remove one of the upper links, like we did before, the Watts link will still keep the axle moving straight up and down. And in cornering, since one link will always be in tension and one link will always be in compression, you don't have the different left to right behavior you see in a panned rod. Watts links behave the same whether you're in a left or a right hand turn. Here again though, it is important that the links start out horizontal. If they don't, the center pivot will not move vertically and will force the axle to move at an angle. Here you can see what happens if the links do not start out horizontal. The axle is clearly moving up and down at an angle. Here in the computer, I've had to remove one of the upper links because the Watts link and the other links are trying to move the axle in different directions now and will fight each other. So how would an OEM go about deciding which of these two designs to use? Well. There are a number of reasons why you would choose one over the other, but a big difference is cost. The panned rod is a single link with relatively cheap brackets at the frame and axle ends. The Watts link, on the other hand, has three pieces with multiple pivot points and is attached to the differential housing on the axle. The differential cover is usually a cheap and easy stamping, but now needs to be beefed up and come with an attachment for the center link. This adds cost and complexity to what would otherwise be a simple design. On the other hand, the Watts link works better. So it becomes a trade-off between function and cost, and for each OEM and each vehicle, that trade-off will come to a different conclusion. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit that subscribe and notifications button, and we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.